When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. If you've seen either of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, uh, the soundtrack for both the movies is a mixtape. It, it's a mom who's made this collection of her favorite songs and given them to her son. And so the first movie, he opens the first one, and then the second movie, he opens the second one, and that becomes the soundtrack that, that kind of is, is the, the bed underneath the whole movie experience. So what you find out is for this, this boy, as he grows up into manhood, the, those songs of that mixtape that his mom gave to him Give voice to his heart. In a moment of romance, there's one of those songs that's just the right song for romance. In a moment of adventure and needing courage to kind of go after something, there's the right song. There's that kind of adventurous, courageous feel to it. In a moment of fear, there's just the right song on that mixtape for this boy in that moment of fear who's become now a man. And those songs mean not just, much, uh, not just as much to him as a man, they mean more to him as a man because he's grown up listening to those songs. They become part of his soul. Well, God, our Heavenly Father, has given us a mixtape. It's called the Book of Psalms. There's 150 songs in the Bible called Psalms. And it's God's heavenly mixtape. And can I tell you something? There's a song for every experience of life in the Book of Psalms. If you're joyful, there's Psalms, songs that help you express your joy. If you're fearful, there's just the right song to give you comfort in your fear. If you're really ticked off and mad, there's just the right song. There's some of those in there too. There's some of those kind of songs. Romance, yes. It's all there in the book of Psalms. That is God's mixtape. And our hope this summer, as we have eight weeks walking through the Psalms mixtape series, is that you would fall in love with the word of God in a new way. And I had something hit me this week. I never thought of this before. I, I, I thought in the past it'd be really neat if we knew the tunes to those songs you know, those 150 songs, psalms, they all had music to them. Oftentimes, the, the, the introductions could say, a psalm of this, a song written by, and at a certain time. And I thought, man, I wish we knew the tunes. But now it struck me this week, I'm glad we don't. Because there's certain tunes I just don't like. There's certain styles of music I don't like, right? And probably ancient Jewish music in so many centuries B.C. might not exactly hit the right chord for you and me. You know what I'm saying? So what we can do is we can take the lyrics, the words, the, the Holy Spirit divinely inspired words, and put whatever tune we want to it. And then we love it. Because I, don't, you know, I think God doesn't want us to, to, I don't like the tune of that one. We don't know the tunes. But the words are powerful. And there is a song in God's mixtape uh, for all of us, for every situation of life. So get to know the book of Psalms this summer. Read the book of Psalms and hear those songs that, that kind of touch all of life. Generally, when we kick off a series like we did last week with this series, I'm here in Monterey at Shoreline to preach the kickoff to any sermon series. I try to make a priority to do that. I'm so glad I wasn't here last week. Because if I had been here, Pastor Dennis wouldn't have been able to preach. And Pastor Dennis, here in the Monterey campus, preached, I think, the best sermon I've ever heard him preach, and maybe one of the best sermons I've ever heard anyone preach. I thought Pastor Dennis did an amazing job. If, yeah, if you weren't here... If you weren't here, go online and listen to the sermon. It was powerful and musical. And what, what I noticed as I listened to Dennis, because we were in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Chicago, doing ministry at the Billy Graham Center, and we had some other commitments, so we were uh, kind of traveling doing ministry this last week. But when I, when I watched and listened to the sermon, I, I was just swept up into it. And what I was reminded of is that music touches our soul. If you were here when Pastor Dennis preached, or if you watched online, you could see there's certain songs. When that, that song came on, man, it just touched Dennis deeply. That's what songs do to us. God has made us musical people. You may, I'm not really into music. Guess what? In some way, you are. Hardwired in our soul is a connection to music, and, and music takes us back to moments in life, brings back sights and smells. You hear a certain song, you're like, boom, I'm in seventh grade again. You're like, oh, I, oh, man, I remember that one. A certain song, oh, that was right after my breakup, and I... <laughs> You know, you got, and you're, you're like, you're, you're swept back. Music does that. And so, so we're going to continue to dig into God's mixtape 
and, and, and we're going to learn together. And so today, we're going to look at a couple of songs in God's mixtape about the beauty and the wonder and the intricacy of God's creation. You know that there's psalms, songs about the beauty of what God has made. And, and, and when I, was, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about just all the little details of God's goodness. Think about a ladybug. You know, God, God made ladybugs. And it puts little dots on their back. I don't know if God hand-painted them, how that works, if he's got like a ladybug factory or how it works, but it's like, you know, just how about some dots there? That's not, I mean, just detail, beauty. And, and, and so I want to I wanna think about these two songs. If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm chapter 8, and also put your finger in Psalm 19. We'll get to those in just a minute. We're going to look at Psalm 8 and Psalm 19. Before we get there, I want to tell you about a song that I heard years ago, Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. And, and you can almost, if you try, you can almost imagine hearing it right now, couldn't you? Uh, I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world, right? Talks about skies, clouds. There's a great line in the second stanza, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night. Here's this beautiful song that just celebrates the beauty of creation. And in God's mixtape, in Psalm chapter 8, there's this declaration of the beauty of God's creation. I want you to listen to the psalm. I want you to use the pictures behind me on the main screen there to kind of get a picture of what it's talking about. Here's the reality, though. No matter what picture, you, you ever travel somewhere amazing and beautiful? Alaska? or the past, I know people who have been traveling to places, place, and you go, oh, i got to capture this and share this with people, and you take a picture, and you show it to them, and you're like, it was really bigger than that. It was, it was more majestic, you, you know, even if you put it on a big TV screen, you can't capture it. But I want to try to capture the feeling. And in your own mind, just picture the beauty of God's creation. Because the Holy Spirit of God inspired through David. Psalm 8. I picture David, I picture David late at night. His sheep are all settled. He's in this open field. The torches are put out. The candles are put out. And it's pitch black. You ever been somewhere where there's like no car lights, no nothing, no, no phone lights, no plug, you know, just nothing. And you look up. And there's this star-pierced sky. You know that, that feeling? You just go, <gasps> have you had that? You know, you know what I'm talking about? That moment you just go, oh, look what God made. I think David was in one of those kind of times and places as the Holy Spirit began to inspire this song in God's mixtape of the book of Psalms. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You know that feeling when you see the, the amazing magnitude of creation, you just go, who are we in light of all this? Yet you have made them, human beings, a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All the flocks and the herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swims the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Boy, David just declares, as led by the Holy Spirit, the beauty and the wonder of God's creation. He, he's overwhelmed He's amazed. He's staggered. And sometimes creation just gently whispers the beauty of God in the little, little details and intricacies, just this little, little whisper of God's glory and beauty and creativity and orderliness. And sometimes creation just screams the glory of God. Anybody here love a good storm? 
I love, Sherry and I, every year when we go to Michigan, we, we want it to be nice and sunny, but we always pray, Lord, let there be one really big storm that comes in over the lake. And there almost always is. In two weeks, there's almost like one day, and, and we just sit in this, not, you're not like on a golf course holding up a three iron in the air and praying for a storm. That would be stupid. But, um, but you're like somewhere safe, and you look out, and you just see the storm coming in, and, and just screams, God is powerful. God is glorious. And so, so the Psalms, one of the things they do is, is they declare the beauty of creation. I had another awakening in my life with music, uh, with a song that before I was a Christian, I was in my young teens, and a musician came out with this album, and on this album, this record album, he had a song called Morning is Broken. And I can, I can almost hear it in the back of my mind. You know, this, this sense of the, the beauty of creation, a new day has begun. And in, in, and in this song, it actually talks about God's recreation of a new day. There's an acknowledgement of God's presence. Well, I grew up in a home with no faith, no Jesus, no God, no creator, no nothing. I, I was taught to believe that, that life is completely random. And I heard this song, the sense of God's presence in a garden, in the flowers, in the sunrise of a new day. And, and it struck my heart. And I started to wonder to myself, could there be a God? Is there more than this? I didn't know when that song came out. I, I, I didn't know that, that when this song released in 1971, that 40 years earlier, in 1931, a godly Christian woman wrote a beautiful hymn of praise called Morning is Broken. And 40 years later, Cat Stevens took that hymn of praise and did it very, very much like it was originally written and sang it. And then later in 1992, Neil Diamond did that song again, because hey, if it's big, do it again, right? <laughs> and re-release it. But I remember for, for me as a young person with no faith, starting to look at around me and wonder, is there a God who's part of all this? And what I discovered is, yes, <laughs> there is. And that God is glorious and wonderful and creative. And so I want to invite you, uh, as we think about four different lessons we can learn from looking at these, these Psalm 8 and Psalm 19, these, these, these songs of praise of creation, because it's not really praising creation, it's praising the creator. It's praising the one who made all of this. And so let's pray. And we're going to think about four different lessons we can learn from these psalms and hopefully carry them into our lives and into our living, singing, walking through a day and celebrating God's goodness. Oh, God, speak to us today. Maker of heaven and earth, maker of us, teach us to appreciate your creation and you as our creator, creating beauty and order and wonder. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a note taker, you'll find in your bulletin a half sheet, and that half sheet gives you four different places to write down four big thoughts about God's glory and wonder and creation. So if you're a note taker, you can write down on that sheet. If you're not a note taker, ignore that and just listen and learn by listening if that's how you learn. Here's lesson number one. The wonder and beauty of creation points us to a wonderful and beautiful creator. Isn't that true? That when you see the wonder and beauty of creation, you say, the one who made this must be more wonderful and more beautiful than the things that he created. So my, uh, my encouragement is that you would understand that it pleases God when we notice, comment, and enjoy his artwork. I think it makes God really happy when we slow down and see what he's made. And so often we're rushing so quickly through life and we don't notice the beauty of all that God has made. Sherry and I were leaving Costco just yesterday and we were coming down Highway 1 towards Monterey. And you know that place, just you leave Costco, you come up Highway 1 and there's kind of a, a, a hump there and you, all of a sudden you see the bay and the ocean. I've seen it a thousand times since I've lived here. But it has staggered me again. I said to Sherry, look at this. I wasn't thinking about the sermon, I was thinking about God and his beauty, and his creativity. And just looking at the waves coming in, and you got about, about, a, about a 15, 20 second time, then you kind of go down and you lose behind the sand dunes. But in those moments, when God shows up and shows you, acknowledge the artwork of the creator. When I was a youth pastor many, many years ago, early in my ministry, we had a young guy in our, in our youth group. This is one of the very first watercolors he ever painted. He painted this in junior high. No lessons at this point just an amazingly gifted artist and, and went on to spend his life in the world of art as an art teacher. Uh, also went on to he and his brother and his mom all became followers of Jesus. But what we learned is that if we walked around his house and if Sherry made any comments about his paintings, very soon she would have one much like the painting she made a comment about. 
because he loved my wife. Not I love my wife, you know, but he was like this young kid who just, he just thought the world of my wife. So one time we were standing and looking, and he had painted a new painting for his mom that was above the fireplace, and it was this seascape. I think of the Monterey coastline, actually. This is actually uh, the, the Lone Cypress here. But I think he had painted something that was along the Monterey coastline there, or at least a picture of it, and he painted this beautiful oil painting, a large oil painting. And Sherry stood there, and she said, oh, that is beautiful. Tell me about how you painted this. And he began to explain it to her. And, and Sherry just kind of reveled in the beauty of it. About two weeks later, knock on our door, it's this young guy. He's got the exact same painting, but with a lot of purples in it, because he said, I know you like purples, so I added purples in the sky, and he had custom made a painting for Sherry. Why? Because she noticed and appreciated. I wonder if God, this is my wondering, I wonder if God, when we really appreciate something in his creation, if he goes, oh, you think that's good? Wait till tomorrow. I got something, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna outdo that. I mean, that's the God we worship. And I believe he takes delight when we slow down and notice. And sometimes we're moving so quickly, things become mundane that are glorious. And can I tell you what we miss sometimes? In all the beauty of creation, you know what, you know what is the apex and the peak and the pinnacle of God's creation? Read the book of Genesis, you know what it is? People. And sometimes we go, oh, that sunrise is beautiful. That person, not so much. Um, sometimes we're like, oh, oh, look, that ocean is majestic. That person mostly irritates me. You know, and we, we, can, we, can all, we can forget that every person you meet is part of God's creation. There's no, even identical twins aren't identical. Every human being who's walked on this earth is part of God's creative work, and we should slow down and notice the beauty and the wonder of God's creation. So how do we enjoy God's wonderful world? Here's my simple encouragement. Slow down, notice, and tell God, nice job. Just, God, wow. Oh, Lord, beautiful. Jesus, the creative word of all the universe, nice job. We need to learn to slow down and drink it in. I had a sabbatical a couple months ago. I'd never had a sabbatical my whole life. I don't like taking time off. I love working, but I had a sabbatical, and so I had to do some stuff with my family. Not do stuff with my family. That sounds terrible. I, I was not allowed to work for six weeks. It was kind of torturous for me, but I had a great time with my family. Loved being with them. Let me get that clear. Love my family. Love being with my family. But I also took three days, four days, and went by myself to, to Lake Tahoe, to Kirkwood, and I snowboarded for, th for three days by myself, and it was glorious. The second day, it was snowing the whole day, so nobody came out. And they had a couple, few inches of, of, of fresh powder. It was wonderful. The next morning, the sun had come out. The snow was gone, and there was about 8 to 12 inches of fresh powder everywhere. And I spent the whole day putting down fresh tracks. If you're not a skier or a snowboarder, you don't understand why I have goosebumps right now when I say that. But I get like all tingly when I think about it. But, I, but it wasn't just being in the snow. It wasn't just snowboarding. But I, I would go down, I would go down, I'd get on the chairlift, and I was going back up. I would sit back on the chairlift. And there was just almost nobody out this day. And I'd sit back, and I just would say, Oh, God, oh, Lord, my Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then I'd go down again. And I'd go back, and I'd say, Oh, my God. And, every, and, and here's the thing. If we praise the creation stuff, that's called idolatry. If we worship mountains, that's idolatry. We worship the maker of the mountains, amen? Yeah. We worship the maker of the heavens and the earth. Not the, if we worship the heavens and the earth, the Bible says don't do that. That's idolatry. We worship the one who made it all, this creative, beautiful, artistic God. The first time I went down to El Salvador with a mission team from Shoreline, uh, we were going down there to work with Compassion International. We've got over 200 children that you all sponsor and that we care for and provide for in El Salvador as a church, over 200 kids in that area. So we went down to do ministry, and I, I brought two things with me in case I was near the ocean. I didn't know if I would be, but in case I was near the ocean, I brought my Vipers. These are my fins. I, I, I used to surf growing up. Now I body surf. And if I can get near waves, I'm in the water. I love it. And this is what I call an old guy Speedo. Um, <laughs> And any old guy, see how it's got legs that go down to here? That's an old guy Speedo. Gentlemen, please, wear one of these. Not the, old, the, not the young guy. Young guys, don't you wear a Speedo either, unless you're Michael Phillips and you're competing, right? But, um, but I took my fins just in case. And when we get there, when we get there, I find out we're staying in the Punta Roca Surf Motel. That's where Compassion International has put us. Right on the water at the best break in all of Central America. So there I stood the next morning, before the sun came up, waiting. 
like a little kid, like a Labrador with my tail wagging, like a little kid, all excited. I'm, just, I'm standing there with my fins in my, in my old guy's Speedo waiting. And as soon as the sun was up, I'm in the water. About five minutes later, Pastor Dennis is in the water too. And we body surfed and hung out in the water and just talked about the glory of God and worshiped until we had to go for about 10 hours of ministry with the, with the kids and then came back and there was still some light back in the water again. All of life. Notice the little things. When Sherry and I go to Michigan every summer for two weeks, we watch the sunset every day. Every day we sit and watch the sunset, and it's different every single day. And it's beautiful every single day. Give honor to God and worship him. Slow down, notice, and tell God, nice job. Number two, the order of creation reveals a God of order and purpose. Is it not working? It's popping, thank you. Apparently, I'm popping. It's in, and it might be popping a little bit still. That's okay. That's different in junior high, my popping and locking days, back when I was a dancer. No. <laughs> that, that one I didn't do. Uh, my brother Jason was into breakdancing, not me. All right. Number two, the order of creation reveals a God of order and purpose. The order of what God has made shows a God who's orderly. When you look at creation and you see the detail and the intricacies, you say, man, there is a God who is all about order. Do, do you know that in your body, there's 30, about, I haven't counted them, but this is what I've been told by scientists, 37.2 trillion cells in your body. That's order. That's amazing. And it all works. And it all functions. When you see the order in creation, it should stagger you. It should amaze you. It should blow your mind. Uh, th there, there was a uh, guy, Rene Descartes, who was a French philosopher in the early 1600s. And Re Rene Descartes tried to explain the idea of God by looking at order in creation. He said, he, he said there's so much order in creation that things in creation, things in life tend to go towards entropy. They tend to fall apart. They tend to get disorderly with time. You have to put force into anything to make it become orderly. So the idea that the, that the universe just happened out of nothing and then, and, and then just kind of became orderly out of disorder there's nothing in all of creation that shows things working that way. And he actually said, if you were walking down a beach, and this, he came up with this little story. If you were walking along a beach and you kicked something in the sand and you found a watch and you took the watch and you looked at it and you said, and you saw, you saw it, keeps, you go, that's keeping time. That's amazing. And then you turn it over and you look on the back, you see, that you see things moving and going around and all these little parts functioning together, keeping time what Descartes said was, nobody would ever say, well, that just came by itself all randomly. Nobody. Everyone would say, there's a watchmaker. Someone made, right? I mean, just common sense. Someone made this. You don't see that kind of order, that kind of intricacy. You don't see that randomly. That ha there, there's, if there's a watch, there's a watchmaker. If there's a universe, there's a universe maker. The, the way that the, the, the planets move around the sun at exactly the right way so they don't collide with each other. There's order beyond that watch. The way our bodies work, there's order beyond comprehension. Where the earth sits in relationship to the sun, you know, scientists would say if we were a certain amount closer, everything would burn up. If we were a certain amount further away, everything would be frozen. Exactly right. It just happened. No. There is a God. There is a master creator and watchmaker who's made it all. And so... Order points us to a thoughtful creator. So how do we enjoy God's wonderful world? When you see order, celebrate the creator and talk about him. That's my encouragement to you. When you see order, when you stand in a mirror and you look at your eyes. Have you, have you ever like gotten really close to me and looked at your eyes and you thought, you, well, we tell things, oh, they're kind of bloodshot. That's kind of weird. But you think, wait a minute. You watch how they zoom in and zoom out, how you can read and I'm getting to a point where I know these are actually tri, trifocals, okay? So, you know, age wears on us, but the, the eyes God has given me, <coughs> just the complexity of my eyes, only an orderly God could design. What's been, so when you notice those things, just stop and say, God, thank you for the order that you've put into all that you've made. Number three, the vastness of creation gives us perspective on who we are. When we see the greatness of God's creation, we can have this sense of, wow, look at the bigness of God. That's why David says in the psalm, when I consider the heavens and the work of your fingers, what are people that you're mindful of them? Children of people that you would care for them. He says, when I look at the bigness of all you've made, who are we? But then he says, but wait, but God, we're precious in your sight. 
It's amazing. We are, the way we view ourselves should be impacted by the way we see God's creation all around us. The vastness of creation gives us perspective on who we are. So in the grandeur of God's wonderful world, humble your heart and your life before him. When you see the greatness of creation, man, it should humble us. We should say, who are we? And yet we're loved by God. It's amazing. I was trying to figure out from a, a science standpoint, I was trying to think of an illustration to show the bigness of the universe, the bigness of this world that we're in. And so I did a little bit of work on this, and I want to ask you to just don't try to write this down. Just try to get it in your brain. Just let your brain be kind of blown away as you listen to this. And i got to tell you right now, all the stuff I'm going to talk about, I didn't measure these things myself. Like, I didn't measure the circumference of the sun. It's just too hot. But I'm, I'm relying on scientists, okay? So, largest object in our solar system, our solar system, largest object is the sun. Now listen to this. The radius of the sun is 43,000 miles and more. The diameter of the sun... uh, 864,000 miles. And listen to this. The circumference all the way around the sun, the circumference of the sun, listen to this, 2,713,406 miles. Okay, you're getting your brain around how big the sun is? With that in mind, how many Earths, our Earth is a pretty big, you know, our Earth is quite large. It It took a while to walk around the planet, right? How many Earths could you fit into the space that the sun takes, into the circumference of the sun. How many earths would it take to fill up the sun? In your mind, 10, 100, 1,000? Okay, here's the answer. 1.3 million earths to fill up the space of the sun. Does that blow your mind? If not, stay with me. There's more, all right? Our sun is only a medium-sized star. Betelgeuse, which is a red giant, massive star, is almost 700 times bigger than our sun. And it has, and, and it shines about 14,000 times brighter than our sun. All right? And then our galaxy, our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. I mean, I can't even, what's a light year? It's a lot. It's, I mean, it take 100,000 years that, that the speed of travel and the speed of light to cross our galaxy. And the Milky Way contains about 200 billion stars, and that's part of our galaxy. That's just our galaxy. And scientists say there's between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies. <laughs> it's just, I mean, some of you are just going, I, you lost me at like the Earth is, is round, you know? But, <laughs> but, but, the, but the point is this. It's massive! beyond our comprehension, and God spoke it all into existence. And God rules over it all. And the God who rules over all of that, listen to this, cares about you personally and specifically. Wow. Yeah, someone say praise God. God God is good, and God is glorious. So how do we enjoy God's wonderful world? Listen, submit your life, your dreams, and your desires to the God who made everything. Boy, the God who made all of that, the God who can sustain all of that by his word of power, he cares about you. He loves you. He came to this planet and died for you. So take your whole life and say, God, I trust you with my life. The God who can make that and manage that, I think you can manage my life. You know what I'm saying? I think you can handle my life and put your trust in him and put your trust in his only son, Jesus, who wants to lead and guide your life. Lesson number four. The declarations of our creator give us a unique place in his creative plan. What God says about you and me gives us a unique place in his creation. Because the psalmist David says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you put in place, what are we? What is mankind that you're mindful of us? Human beings that you care about us. He says, why, what do we matter? But then he says this, inspired by the Holy Spirit in this beautiful mixtape song about creation. He says, But you have made us a little lower than the angels. You've crowned human beings with glory and honor. You've made us rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under our feet. He says, but God, you've given us dominion and authority over the things you've created that are around us. And listen closely. God gives his dominion and authority not to destroy the earth and to destroy his things, but to care for it. Of all the people on this planet who should care about the planet, it should be Christians most of all. Because we know the artist. We know who made it. 
If I took this piece of art, I've I just told you a little bit about this high school student. You don't, you've never even met this high school student. If I took this right now, if I pulled it out of the frame, and if I ripped this up into 50 pieces and threw it on the ground, you would all be like, how can you do that? You've not even met this, the guy who painted this. But you would be like, you'd be offended and bothered. I mean, if I stood here and just, just took an ink and crossed it out, you'd be like, you can't do that. And yet God, the master artist, has made his creation and we don't always care for it the way we should. In a hundred little ways and in a hundred big ways, we honor God when we care for his creation. And so when you think about creation, what God has made, and, 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 and the beauty of it and the intricacy of it, and, and the fact that God says, I've given you a place of responsibility, we should hear the call of our creator. Listen to these three things. I think God says this, take care of the world I give you. Take care of this world. Care for it. Not just for you and your kids and your grandkids. Listen to me. For the glory of God. Because I wouldn't tear that artwork up because I care about that young man who painted it. And I wouldn't want to misuse God's creation because I care about the God who made it. Get the point? So yes, yes for our children and grandchildren. Absolutely. But how about for the glory of God? We notice and take care of his creation. Second, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Why? Why? Because Psalm 139 says, in your mother's womb, God made you and knew you and loved you. How we care for ourselves matters to God. Why? Because we're not just part of his creation. You know what God says? We're the best part of his creation. So care for yourself. And then number three, take care of other people. Well, even the ones that irritate you? Yes. Even the ones who don't recognize that God made all things and that God loves them? Yes. Why? Because they are God's handiwork. And God made them too. And Jesus came for them too. And Jesus gave his life for all who would believe. And so care for creation and care for yourself and care for other people because we are also part of creation. We have to accept the staggering fact that God really cares about people. In all of God's creation, what he cares about most is people. In the beginning of Genesis, in the very beginning, when God created all these different you know, animals and, and trees and, and mount, mountains and seas and the heavenly bodies, says God said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. When it came to people, God said, very good. Very good. God loves people and cares about people. Jesus died on the cross for people because to show the love of the Father. So how do we enjoy God's wonderful world? It's just those three things, day in and day out. Be a responsible steward of creation. Boy, look around and see creation and what God has made and see it as God's beautiful artwork and take good care of it. You see trash on the ground? Pick it up. We can talk about changing the planet, but when you walk by trash and don't pick it up, you just missed a chance to change the planet. We want the big grandiose things that we'll never get around to. How about the little things we can do every day? You know, think about how we can care for creation and then see yourself through the eyes and the heart of God. When you get up in the morning, when you look in a mirror, no matter what you think you see, you are seeing a beloved creation of the creative God of the universe and he didn't make a mistake. And he loves you. And he looks at you with delight. Say, God, can I see myself more through your eyes? And then third, other people. Boy, you should go through your day Bring those words of blessing, those words of encouragement, those people that, that, that so frustrate you that you just want to, oh, you know, say, but God, they're still your children loved by you. And Jesus longs that they would know his grace too. Love people the way that Jesus does. Well, last week, Pastor Dennis finished his sermon by sharing a psalm he wrote. So he called it Psalm 151, Right? And if you weren't here, you'll see it on the video when you watch it, on the website. But Psalm 151, and he gave his psalm. And he said, nobody can have Psalm 151. I have dibs on it. Now, let me be very clear. Don't add that to your Bibles. A Dennis' psalm is not the word. It was beautiful, but it's not the word of God. What it is, it's, it's his prayer. Trying to put in his own words what he wanted to express to God. So I wrote a psalm, because I want to be like Dennis. <laughs> and I call it Psalm 152. So if you get working right now, you can write Psalm 153, but if you wait till next, Saturday, next Sunday, you might miss your chance for Psalm 153 also. But here's my prayer that I wrote, and I just want to do this as my prayer and our prayer as we close our time together. This is my prayer looking at God's creation and who we are in His sight. God of heaven, you are bigger than the galaxies, yet you made every cell in my body. 
I feel your power in the pounding crash of ocean waves. I see your beauty in mountains buried deep in fresh snow powder. I hear you speak in the wonder of a star-pierced sky. I see your majesty in sunsets and summer storms. I encounter, encounter your creative presence in roses and wildflowers, in dogs and cats and every living creature I see. Most of all, I see you in the faces and the lives of the people I meet every day, made in your image, loved by you, and precious in your sight, even when they don't know it. I see your redemptive grace revealed in your heavenly Son, Jesus the Messiah, who is not only the great word who spoke creation into being, but who also entered creation to save us. Your artwork is beautiful, creative, powerful, stunning, breathtaking. God of heaven, you are bigger than the galaxies, yet you are present and revealing yourself every moment of every day. That's the God we gather to worship. 